Thinking about women in their 40s and 50s at uh, very busy times in their life when they're often looking after children, have heavy uh, work responsibilities, maybe uh, responsibilities for el elderly parents who suddenly feel that they cannot cope, that they're exhausted, that they're failing and simply do not realise they're going through a natural ageing process. And actually, uh, a lot of women assume that it's just hot flushes and your period stop. They do not realise it's brain fog, low mood, weight gain, headaches, not being able to sleep. And it's a light bulb moment when they're able to realise that this is actually the menopause they're going through. There are over 30 symptoms of the menopause uh, and some women will experience some, some will experience all and some will experience debilitating symptoms that completely transform their life. And with around 400,000 women entering the menopause each year, access to high quality healthcare support is essential. All women going through the menopause should be able to have conversations with healthcare practitioners, whether that's their practice nurse, their GP, a counsellor or a pharmacist. And NICE have guidelines on diagnosing and managing the menopause, which state that an individualised approach should be adopted at all stages, diagnosis, investigation and management of the menopause. Uh, and just to confirm to my honourable friend uh, from the cities of London and Westminster, NICE guidelines do say that after three months of taking HRT, it is recommended that GPs uh, prescribe annually uh, for women uh, having HRT, but we know in practice that doesn't always happen. The guidelines outline the information that, the men that menopausal women should be given by clinicians to support the management of symptoms and include guidance on HRT, non-hormonal treatment and non-pharmaceutical uh, approaches as well. And it does recommend that HRT is appropriate for most women. Um, but unfortunately, what we find is pres uh, prescribing is relatively low. Only a minority of women currently get access to HRT mainly based on flawed research from about a decade ago, which uh, raised concerns for both women and healthcare practitioners uh, who are no, not confident in necessarily prescribing um, HRT. And so it's so important uh, that work is undertaken with stakeholders to develop and implement optimal care pathways uh, for women. Now, just to touch on some of the issues raised specifically in the debate, particularly around the workplace, and I know the Select Committee will be undertaking its inquiry fa fairly soon, um, because I'm, I'm very keen to work with the Select Committee on that and keen to see their findings as well. Because with one in four women in the workplace being either menopausal or postmenopausal, it's important that employers pay their part too. Uh, companies like Channel 4, ASOS, Vodafone and HSBC and many others mentioned today are doing tremendous work and can I say that the NHS itself as a, a, a workforce which is 77% female is working to develop a menopause workplace support package which will be pioneered in the NHS through local health si uh, systems and so there is some uh, green shoots of progress being made but a huge amount more to be done. And obviously, uh, we are considering a, a, as a government how we can influence that debate. Um, now, the honourable member, right honourable member for Romsey and Southampton North, has spoken about uh, the, the, the issue in particular. And I just want to put on the record uh, that I'm very keen to work with her and her committee to, move, to make progress on this issue. Now, the women's health care strategy um, is something that we've mentioned uh, in this debate as well. And I'm really pleased that the government uh, launched uh, the consultation on this in March this year. And it's the, uh, it's the establishment of England's first ever women's health care strategy. And the response was absolutely huge. Um, in the call for evidence, over 110,000 responses were uh, made on the online survey. And over 500 organisations provided written submissions. Now, for women aged 40 to 49 and 50 to 59, the menopause was the number one response uh, that they wanted the women's health uh, strategy to cover. And so I'm really pleased to announce today that the menopause will be a priority when we publish the women's health strategy in the coming months. Um, because the lesson today, uh, Mr Speaker, is that we, need, we don't uh, just need to talk about it, we need to act uh, and support women through this, whether that's in the workplace or whether that is uh, in supporting women getting access to the treatment they need and whether it is about raising awareness uh, both for women in themselves, so they know they're going through the menopause, but for society as a whole that there's better recognition for it. 
because we don't talk enough about that, how uh, the menopause uh, uh, affects uh, women. Uh, and I had a contact from my honourable friend from Eastbourne to say they're not just talking about the menopause in Eastbourne, they're singing about it too, with the theatres uh, running uh, Menopause the Musical uh, uh, so that, <laughs> that to raise the price. So it's up in lights uh, uh, down in Eastbourne if anyone wants to, to attend. <laughs> But the, uh, my honourable friend from uh, Swansea East is completely right. We need to do much more than talk about this. We will have another opportunity to continue the debate next Friday, and I will be uh, talking to her in between now and then to see what progress we can make. Because as we've heard today, the damaging taboos, the stigmas that prevent women from speaking about their experience uh, need to change. It's difficult to access support at the moment, and we need to do something about it. And I'm committed as the Minister responsible for women's health uh, to supporting women uh, through the menopause reach their potential and live healthier and happier lives. Um, and I'm convinced that we can make progress and that maybe a revolution is about to happen. Um, and I believe we're about to see a seismic change in the way society and healthcare systems understand and support women experiencing the menopause. Yeah. And the final contribution, <laughs> Carolyn Harris. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I hope colleagues truly appreciate the impact that us in this place talking about this subject has on those watching and listening. I've lost count of the people who've contacted me and thanked me for raising the issue and the emotion and gratitude for these women who finally feel that they have a voice is truly overwhelming. But this parliament is not just being watched by the women out there today. They've been watched on a global stage. Me on a global stage. It's terrifying, isn't it? <laughs> but I am absolutely loving the fact that I have legislators, press, medical professions and academics from right across the world saying you were talking about something in the UK Parliament, we want to learn from you. We will be world leaders on this. And we have warriors like Davina McCall, Louise Newsom, Penny Lancaster, Louise Minchin, Lisa Snowden, Gabby Logan, Nadia Swali, Mariella Falstrap, Kate Muir, prominent women in the media who were telling their story, the Countess of Wessex and so many more voices. And everyone in this place brave enough to embrace talking about the menopause is a menopause warrior. And you are playing a huge role in allowing women to be fabulous all their lives. So words I never thought we'd say in the House of Commons chamber. Long live the revolution. <laughs> they don't come more fabulous than you, Carolyn. <laughs> Uh, congratulations to everyone taking part in this debate and uh, I'm really pleased that uh, Sir David Amos was mentioned today and I'm absolutely certain had the tragedy not happened he would have been here today cheering you all. The question is, as on the order paper, as many of them can say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I beg to move that this House do now adjourn. The question is that this House do now adjourn. <laughs> and I call Abena Apong Azari to move the debate on Black History Month. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I begin by thanking Mr Speaker for selecting this important adjournment debate and ensuring that we can once again debate Black History Month during the month of October. Yeah. Last year, through the backbench business debate, I held the first Black History Month debate in the Chamber in five years. This was an extremely well-attended debate with many good contributions from across the Chamber. I'm pleased we are able to, to, um, to debate this topic once again and I'm very sorry fewer colleagues will be able to take part although my honourable friend for Streatham is holding a backbench business debate in Westminster Hall next week. Black, Black History Month is an extremely important annual event, but I strongly believe that we should be talking about Black History, Month, History Week week, out, week in, week out, rather than just once a year. The theme of this year's Black History Month is proud to be, and I would like to begin my speech, as I did last year, by highlighting and celebrating a number of black Britons who have been underappreciated and underrecognised in our national discourse. These black Britons are great Britons and we should celebrate them as such. 
I once again pay tribute to Akil Yaba Adai Seba, coordinator of special projects for the Greater London Council, who organised the first recognition of this month in 1987. This year, we have seen outstanding campaigning from Marcus Rashford, who has done so much to help people, children living in poverty. But I also want to mention another footballer, Jack Leslie, who played for Plymouth Argyle in the 1920s. My honourable friend for Plymouth, Sutton and Devonport recently told me the story of Jack Leslie, who would have been the first black player in England team in 1925, except his name was withdrawn from the selection because of the colour of his skin. It was not until 1978 when the first black player would finally join the national team. There is now an excellent campaign for the statue to be erected in Jack's honour in Plymouth. Mary Prince, who was the first woman to present an anti-slavery petition to Parliament and the first black woman to write and publish an autobiography. I understand there is a petition that proposes to replace this statue outside the Museum of London Docklands with a statue. At this point, I commend the Mayor of London and the Black Culture Archives for producing the Black History Achievement, celebrating the rich and varied contribution black people have made to London and the UK from the Tudor times to the present day. I strongly encourage people to look up their local black heroes. I also want to congratulate my friend, Lord Simon Woolley, on becoming the first black man to lead an, an Oxbridge College. He is a trailblazer. I must not forget in mentioning the Honourable Member for Hackney North and Stoke Newington, the first black woman elected to Parliament, yeah, yeah, yeah. who has been a trailblazer for many black yeah, MPs yeah, yeah. in Parliament. I'll be delighted to give way. <laughs> well, I think first of all, first of all, commend the Honourable for Arthur and Thameshead for bringing this forward. It's a really important issue, and I'm here to support her for that purpose. Uh, history should be rich, and we should ensure that British history is, in, is taught in schools. But does the Honourable Lady agree that the curriculum should also have a time factored in each year for local history to help children to learn the history of local communities that the Honourable Lady has just referred to across the whole of the United Kingdom, and the, and the immense contribution of black history? heritage and culture that this nation has, thanks to that. I want to thank the Honourable Member for mentioning that point. I completely support that. And I'll be also mentioning this um, later on in my speech to, um, to talk about this in detail. Um, as the Honourable Member friend has mentioned, it's important to know about local history. So I want to celebrate my constituents, like Melroy's, a nurse at Greenwich and Bexley Community Hospice, who said every day, we as black nurses go to work we take our role seriously. However, we are confronted on a regular basis by people who do not appreciate us right. because of who we are. Right. Our cultural identity is either mocked or discarded rather than accepted. We strive through hundreds of hurdles, we skip, we jump, we swim, and we keep smiling. We learn, we grow, we move forward a few steps down the line and we bounce back. We are resilient. Mel Rose's testimony reminds me of the great sacrifices many black people have made over the last years as part of the COVID pandemic. Another constituent, Florence Okimbozi, part of the World Hope Organisation Abbey Wood, worked throughout the lockdown to reach out to vulnerable families with their own food bank service. Will, will my honourable friend give way? I'd be delighted to give way. I'm grateful to my honourable friend. If we're talking about black heroes and heroines, who could be more heroic than that generation of black nurses from all over the Commonwealth right. who helped to build the NHS post-war, the NHS of which we are all so proud today? Yeah. Thank you. I'm delighted that Honourable, Honourable Friend has mentioned that. This is something that I'm particularly passionate about, particularly as a family that have worked in the NHS and I'm particularly concerned about particularly the Windrush generation who have, I have to say, the government has yet to provide adequate support to those individuals. And I hope the Minister will be able to highlight after this in his closing what support he's going to do to that generation that has contributed so much to the NHS, as my honourable friend has mentioned. I also want to mention Lara Alabi, based in Tesmead, who won a community award for setting up Seniors in Touch a weekly club for over 50s in Thamesmead to tackle isolation issues related to health and lack of confidence. As well as paying tribute to under-acknowledged Black Britons, 
I also want to use this debate to highlight the, some of the inequalities that continue to affect black people in this country and that I believe the government must do more to address. The first is black maternity health. Yes. There have been two important Westminster Hall debates on this issue over the last year and I pay tribute to my honourable friend for Streatham for leading on those debates. I also pay tribute to the group Five Times More, which has done so much to bring this issue up on the political agenda. They have highlighted the stark disparity in outcomes that black women face when giving birth in this country. Black women are four times more likely to die in pregnancy or childbirth. Black women are up to 83% more likely to suffer a near miss during pregnancy. Black babies have 121% increased risk of stillbirth and 50% risk of neonatal death. Miscarriage rates are 40% higher in black women and the black ethnicity is regarded as a risk factor for miscarriage. Put it simply, giving birth as a black woman is considerably riskier than for women of other ethnicities. The government knows that this inequality exists and now is the time for action. Yeah. Well, yeah. Friend, give way. I'd be delighted to give way. Thank you very much. Um, my honourable friend will be aware um, and has highlighted quite well the statistics, and she'll also be aware that the government still has no target to end it. Does she agree with me that the fact that the government has decided not to set a target, not to look at institutional racism within the NHS, is, is going no way to solving the issues that she's just so eloquently raised? Yeah. Thank you. And I want to thank the honour my honourable friend for the work she's done on this. This is completely accurate. We need a target to end racial maternity health equalities and an action plan for achieving this. This plan should include action to improve data collection, to, to increase the support for at-risk women, to implement the recommendations of the Joint Committee on Human Rights Report on this issue, and to identify the barriers to accessing maternal mental health services. But most of all, I urge the government to listen to the experiences of black women, to engage with them directly, to hear their concerns and to take them seriously. Yes. I turn now to another issue that affects <coughs> black women and girls, the lack of specialist training for police and other agencies supporting black women who are victims of domestic abuse. Here I pay tribute to the organisation Sister Space a domestic abuse charity supporting women of African and Caribbean heritage. I met with them recently to discuss their petition to introduce Valerie's Law. This is named in memory of Valerie Ford, who was murdered by her former partner in 2014 alongside their 22-year-old month daughter. She had previously asked the police for help after her ex-partner had threatened to burn down her house with her in it. But this was recorded only as a threat to her property. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Whilst this is shocking, this story is sadly not uncommon. Too many black women do not get the support they need because the police are not trained to spot and deal appropriately with domestic violence in black communities. These include things such as missing signs of domestic violence on black skin to a lack of cultural knowledge about how threats can be communicated. We need mandatory specialist training for the police and others on all of this and more. I hope the government will seriously consider this part of the renewed focus on violence against women and girls given recent events. I now wish to return to the ask of the government I made during Black History Month debate last year. The first was action to diversify the curriculum. As I said last year, I want our children, black and white, in every single corner of this country to better understand our national history and our national culture. This of course includes the good and the bad and the full range of experience people have had. I'm pleased to see some progress on this and I pay particular tribute to the Welsh Government who have become the first UK nation to, to make teaching of black, Asian and minority ethnic histories and experiences mandatory <laughs> in the school curriculum. Right. Brilliant. The OCR exam board has also recently announced that it's doubling the choice of books by writers of colour in A-levels English qualification. But more action is needed from the government on this 
and I hope the new Secretary of State for Education, who I congratulate on his appointment, will make this a priority. Black history is British history, and we need to teach it all year round. My second ask from the Government from last year was to implement a race equality strategy and an action plan. There has been much discussion in the last year about inequality and structural racism that exists in our country, not least in response to the controversial Sewell report. But we haven't seen anywhere near enough concrete action from the government. A race equality strategy and an action plan covering areas such as education, health and employment are desperately needed. It should include specific proposals to address well-known inequalities such as the ethnicity pay gap, yeah. unequal access to justice, yes. and the impact of, pan of the pandemic on black people. Yeah. I fully support my party's policy to implement a new Race Equality Act to tra tackle structural racial inequality at source, following the excellent work of Baroness Doreen Lawrence, looking at how the pandemic has impacted black and other minority ethnic groups. I say to the government, we've seen the review after review, but now is the time for action. To conclude, Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to be clear that this discussion should not become a conversation about culture wars. Mm. In those culture wars, we end up pitting poor white people against poor black people. Right. So, may, so some may say to poor white people that you are in this situation because footballers are taking the knee. This place is better than that. Yes. In Black History Month, our message should be we want to give black people hope and white people hope. Our message to white people in Black History Month is that our history is your history too. A lot of what has happened to us involves you too. And we're not saying that you are responsible, but we are saying we all need to better understand that. I would not allow us to be divided. We are not, when we are divided, extremism flourishes. I will not allow this under my watch. Black History Month tells me to tell you that we learn from our past to build a better future. We must learn from our past to build a better future. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And um, first of all, may I thank the Honourable Member for Erith and Thamesmead for tabling this debate. Um, it's something I was keen to do for the Equalities team because it's something uh, I've taken a long interest in, time, in my whole time in public life in terms of uh, working on equalities. Not always on this area, but it is something I wanted to uh, pay attention to. I'd also like to thank those colleagues who have come along to support and those who have intervened to make specific points. It is an important, often adjournment debates can be because at the end of the day can sometimes think that people don't think they're important, but they are. So I do appreciate everyone who's come along to support and take part. And during Black History Month, we rightly recognise the contribution of black Britons to our national life and history. From the Windrush generation, who helped, as an honourable lady said, rebuild this great country after the war, helped to rebuild the NHS and continue uh, to run the NHS alongside others. Those black Britons, and we pay tribute to them, who have saved countless lives uh, working um, in the NHS through the pandemic. Uh, and I will ensure uh, I don't have an answer to the specific question the Honourable Lady uh, uh, raised about this support, but I will make sure uh, that my friend, the, the Minister uh, for Women and Equalities, does respond fully. And uh, generally speaking, if there's anything I don't cover, I will make sure that my colleague writes to any particular member. Uh, if they contact me with any questions that I've not answered, I'm more than happy to ensure that my ministerial colleague writes back in full. I do think that uh, it is right that we pay tribute to those who take part in our life, especially those who are coming forward uh, from the black community. I was delighted to see the Paralympic, Paralympic gold medalist Kadena Cox at the first leg of the Commonwealth Games baton relay in Birmingham earlier this month. In terms of the, the relay going from Buckingham Palace, it was quite inspirational to see one of our leading Olympians uh, lead the baton. Her story is truly remarkable. 
and she is just one of many of the inspiring black role models across our society in sports, arts, government and business. And if I may, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, I am going to embarrass the honourable member for Hackney North and Stoke Newington. She won't remember, but quite a long time ago, um, I was at a dinner which um, she shared with Michael Portillo, and it was a prize from the Stonewall fundraising dinner. And I was sat alongside her for the whole evening. And I have to say, uh, and you might, I'm sorry to embarrass you, that a Tory politician is there to say to you that you were a role model. And I remember saying to you at the time, um, you, those of you who may not be old enough to remember, there used to be a back page of the Sunday Times magazine about a, you know, a day in the life of. And I remember saying to the honourable lady that she was the epitome of a constituency MP and how I thought that was absolutely inspiring. So I'm sorry to embarrass you uh, for praise from this side of the House. But it was truly a long time. It might, have, it might have been a long time ago, but I have to say it, uh, it has never, never left me. Um, but as the Honourable Lady, uh, the Member said in leading the debate, um, following the events of last year, Britain has engaged in a thorough examination of racial inequality. And in response, um, this Government has carefully examined the evidence and data, and we believe it is right to recognise where progress has been made, but also that we need to tackle barriers that still stand. We can't level up the country. Sorry. The Minister giving way. In just over an hour's time, York Labour are proposing that York becomes an anti racist and inclusive city. However, we don't want this just to be a name tag, but to be about an action plan about our path for the future. Would the government consider funding such initiatives in order to ensure that that aspiration becomes a reality? The Honourable Lady is tempting me outside of my portfolio, uh, and so I can't. Pending commitments, otherwise, I think the Chancellor uh, might. Uh, my ministerial career might be cut very short. It's been six weeks, and I'd, I'd like to like it to go a little bit longer. Uh, but I will ensure that uh, my officials will take that away and get the Honourable Lady a, a full response. I can't promise it will be a response she likes, but it will certainly be a response. I think it's something, as you say, it's something that the government should consider. Um, but going back to the, the issue about levelling up. We can't genuinely level up unless we remove the obstacles that stand in the way of some of our uh, people. And it's in the spirit that the Prime Minister established the Sewell Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities. I know people may have different views on that commission, uh, but let's park those and look for the good uh, rather than and seek to dwell on what we disagree on. The Commission did publish its report earlier this year, and it showed that racism and discrimination remains a factor in shaping life's outcomes. For instance, discrimination against names that are recognised as not being traditionally British exist when CVs are reviewed in the jobs market, for one example. And this should not be happening um, in Britain in 2021. However, the Commission found that there were disparities between ethnic groups uh, where uh, disparities between ethnic groups exist. Factors other than racism uh, are often the principal cause, and that's something that needs to be explored. I can assure the House that this Government is intent on doing everything in its power to drive out discrimination. For instance, we are shocked by the torrents of online abuse our footballers received for no other reason than their skin colour. And I hope that our online safety bill um, remains ambitious and that it will help hold those um, who are cowed enough to hide behind uh, online abuse. I hope that they will be held to account. If I could turn just to a couple of questions that the Honourable Lady um, proposed in the debate mentioned, and turn for firstly black maternal health. Our NHS makes the UK one of the safest places in the world to have a baby, but every death is a tragedy. Last month, NHS England published a targeted plan to improve outcomes for mothers and babies from ethnic minority groups, a plan which will provide almost seven million of support to local maternity systems. And our most senior midwife, Professor Dunkley Bent, is leading important work in this area. We trust her judgment and value the brilliant work she is doing. And of course, with operational independence, we can ensure that the NHS listen and take heed of what we want it to do, whilst allowing them to get on with their professional judgment. Specialist ethnic training for the police on domestic abuse was another issue that was raised, and it's one that I fully understand. A slight segue. It's, um, 
uh, as part of my equalities brief, I have equally been raising the ability of the police to respond to same-sex domestic violence. And I think the Honourable Lady may, may, raises a very good point. Uh, very often, our police who do uh, an amazing job in many areas sometimes uh, are not fully attuned um, to what domestic violence is really about. Uh, and I know that domestic abuse affects um, a wide and disparate group and a one-size-fits-all approach is not appropriate, particularly for those with specific needs like ethnic minority victims. But, of course... Thank you, Minister, for giving away. Um, I think one of the things that I want to rec recommend is that you meet with Sister Space, um, because they have done quite a lot of work, particularly on this and Valerie's Law, and I feel very strongly they'll be able to help the government in terms of making sure you implement, uh, the government implements something that would really benefit a lot of individuals from across the country and also the police force and it goes in line with like what, what's happened recently um, in terms of working towards the government's updated walk strategy. Um, I, I thank the Honourable Lady and I, I will ensure that my ministerial colleague um, gets that message. I, I can't commit to her diary, tempting though it is, um, to ensure that um, she looks at that. What we are doing is, uh, is ensuring that we continue to try and uh, encourage and cajole um, forces to take the College of Policing's domestic abuse matters training, which includes specific training on the different impacts of domestic abuse on black and minority ethnicity communities. But the Honourable Lady makes a very good point. Speaking to those groups who can speak with a, a voice of knowledge uh, and of probably experience, I don't know the group, but quite often these groups have personal experience which is far more powerful than any politician talking about the subject. So I do think it's a very valid point, and I will urge my ministerial colleague uh, to take up that offer of meeting. Um, the Honourable Lady also talked about diversity, about diversifying the curriculum. And she's right that children should learn all aspects of British history, and we must teach them about the contributions of Britons of all, all ethnicities who have made our country what it is today. Now, the flexibility within the national history curriculum gives teachers the opportunity to focus on ethnic minority voices and experiences. Their contribution to our shared British history can and should be taught. We know that the vast majority of schools are already doing this, whether it's through discussing national events such as the Bristol bus boycott or the soldiers from across the world who fought alongside Britain in both world wars. So I think the Honourable Lady has made some remarkably strong points. Um, one of the things I always commit if I am covering a debate um, for a colleague, which is, although uh, equality is part of the equalities team, is to make sure that the points raised are followed through on. I don't believe in standing at the dispatch box saying, yes, I'll ask a colleague to look at it without making sure that happens. And I will ensure that the notes I've taken today, that my colleague follows through on them. So, uh, Mr. Of course. I, th I thank the Minister for giving way. I, I, I really struck by that last point about the importance of taking things back, and I was very struck by the point that the member for Erith and Thamesmead made when she spoke of the hope that is important and also um, the importance of not sowing division. So I wonder, will the Minister take back those key messages which really struck me from the contribution made? Two Ministers, please. Minister. My old friend is, is right. Um, we there's always a danger that people looking in think it's always adversarial and, and certainly the chamber can be adversarial but also i always tell people that behind the scenes actually we're much more collegiate than perhaps the television cameras would suggest and certainly uh, i always want that even where we have differences that they should be respectful differences and that we work together to try and close any gaps between what we want to achieve uh, and what the outcomes we want to achieve. Because I think, generally speaking, we all want the same thing. Uh, we might have differences of opinion on speed and some of the actions, but I do think that we should have a very constructive and collegiate way forward. And certainly, I hope, that will be my style going forward. And so, um, just trying to close this important debate, if I may, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, racism has no place in our society. And it is vital that the fight against it is emphasised not during Black History Month, but all year round. The Sewell Commission made an important contribution to our national conversation about race and the Government's efforts to level up and unite this country. Our response to the Commission will be published shortly. It will set out a cross-Government plan 
for building a fairer Britain. And this means tackling discrimination, but also spreading opportunity. So regardless of where anyone lives or their socio-economic background, they can fulfil their potential. And I'm sure that this is a mission the entire House can and will support. Thank you. The question is that this House do now adjourn. As many that I can say aye. aye. I, continue. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order. Order. The proceeding has ended.